Hello, this is John Baugh, and it's session 11, and we're going to be talking about inheritance today and a couple other uh, topics near the end. And then we'll be going over our capstone project, which is um, which is going to be due at the end of the at the end of the uh, the semester, essentially. So, um, first thing uh, we're going to talk about are some. Uh, um, just some topics, like an overview, some concepts behind inheritance, and then we'll get into some actual code. So um, we discussed in previous chapters how there are three fundamental pillars of object-oriented programming. Um, these three fundamental pillars uh, that make up an object-oriented program are encapsulation, inheritance, and polymorphism. So we discussed encapsulation before, um, that's essentially where we combine um, the um, attributes and the behaviors into a single entity. Um, that helps us to uh, treat um, all of these behaviors and data uh, together as one single entity, an object okay, of a class, uh, rather than having data strewn all over the place. So that... Um, that gives us several different benefits which we discussed. Um, the next um, pillar of object-oriented programming is inheritance. Now we did, I believe, a brief overview in a previous um, lecture about what inheritance is, uh, but we'll, we'll cover it again here. So um, inheritance is essentially a form of software uh, reusability or software reuse. Um, new classes can be created uh, from uh, already defined classes. So if you have one class that already has um, data and behavior uh, that you need, then um, you can uh, use that class to define another class. So for example, let's say that we have an animal class. Okay, so you would maybe include some data and perhaps some behaviors that all animals have in common, you know, that distinguish them from plants and fungus and uh, protozoans and bacteria, etc., uh, all the other kingdoms of life. So you'd, you'd make some basic information in an animal class, and then from that you could derive maybe a mammal class, an avian class, reptile, amphibian, so there's different things you can derive from the derive from the animal class and different uh, categories or classifications classes that you can derive from um, that animal class or yeah animal class mammal let's say we have a class called mammal um, uh, you could inherit from the mammal class derive other classes from the mammal class and create even further classes, dog, cat, horse, gorilla, monkey, human, um, all kinds of different uh, different uh, mammals. All right, so the two major terms that we need to know in order to understand inheritance, and I've used them already, and I hope they have maybe an intuitive feel, feel to them, uh, are base class and derived class. So in C++, we typically use the term base class to refer to a class that is derived from. And a derived class inherits these attributes and behaviors from a base class. So for example, um, when you're using these terms, um, you're talking about two classes in particular that are in an inheritance hierarchy. Um, because a class is a base class does not mean that it can't be a derived class of another class. So for example, when we have animal at the top, then you have mammal, and then you have dog, okay, so animal at the very top, mammal, and then dog. Um, animal would be a base class of the mammal class. Mammal class is the base class of uh, the dog class, okay, but you'll notice that mammal class is both a base class and a derived class, okay, so mammals, mammals base class that it derives from is animal. And um, a class that derives from mammal is dog. Okay, so um, in Java, 
you typically call base classes superclasses, and you typically call derived classes subclasses. Um, so this process of creating classes and organizing them in an inheritance hierarchy is called classification. So uh, actually, whenever you organize a class in general, even if there's no inheritance, we call it classification. Um, but it's also uh, a form of classification when you when you put the class and organize it uh, within an inheritance hierarchy when you design a class. Um, you can say that class A inherits from class B or you might say that class A extends class B um, because it extends the functionality of, of a further class. So we would say that the when you have a derived class that it is a specialization of the base class from which it derives. So a mammal is an animal. We would agree with that. But it's not just an, am uh, an animal. It also adds uh, behavior and it also adds data that is unique to mammals that not all animals uh, have in common. Okay, live birth, uh, feeds young with, it, with milk, um, etc. And in C++, uh, you use the colon in order to define a um, relationship between two classes. Okay, so for example, um, if I want to, um, if I have a generic class, I'm just going to call it, I'm just going to say class name, then you say class name colon, and then you put an ac uh, access specifier, um, and then the base class name. And then you do your, def your uh, definition, class definition inside the body of the class, of course. So a more concrete example would be something like circle, for example, might inherit from a class called shape. And by access specifier, we mean public. Notice that I do not put the brackets around public. That's just to show that it's an optional, uh, optional thing. Because if you don't put it, we have what's called um, private inheritance. Um, which we'll only touch on briefly. We'll be dealing with public inheritance exclusively um, in, in this um, lecture. So, all right, so the next thing, um, we've got this uh, right here open, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, if any of you are noticing, I'm kind of going off of the supplemental material, but I'm going to skip the first example that I did and do the second example because it's a little more thorough. Um, so I'm doing a uh, case study of rectangle and a cube to give an example of um, the commonalities that we will exploit between the rectangle and the derived class cube. So we'll have a base class we're going to call rectangle, and we're going to have a derived class we're going to call cube. So um, first thing, we'll add a header for rectangle. We'll work on the base class first, Okay, rectangle.h. The include guards here. All right. And we're going to just add the skeleton of the class. That's usually how I how I write, and then put the public and private sections um, that we're going to have in our class. So in the public section of rectangle, now this this is basically um, almost identical to what we did in previous chapters when we were just creating a rectangle class, because in the base class, you uh, unless the base class is also a derived class of another class, which is not the case here, rectangle will be a, um, a, first, class, a first class ancestor of uh, the, the cube class, which we're going to derive. So you may not even notice any, you won't notice anything that has anything to do with inheritance here. As far as we're just concerned, this is just a class. So I'm going to have a default constructor, and then you're also going to have an overloaded constructor um, that takes the length and the width okay, of the rectangle. And by the way, in the private uh, area, we're going to put um, width and um, length. Okay, so that's the data we're maintaining about the tri uh, the uh, rectangle, and then we're going to have a kind of a set all called uh, set dimension 
couple lengths, a couple widths. Okay, and then we're going to have get length, which is const because it's a getter, and then get width, which is const because it's also a getter. Um, and then we're going to have some methods or some uh, member functions that are going to calculate values and return them. They are also counts because they don't modify the internal data members. And we're going to have a print function, which will just uh, print some information about our rectangle. Okay, so we could uh, have a set length and a set width separately if we want to. Um, the sky is pretty much the limit when we make classes. We can do whatever we want, but this one we just have a set dimension. It does both. Okay, so we've got the .h file created for the rectangle class. Now I'm going to create a source file for the rectangle class. Okay, so it's going to be called rectangle.cpp. And in this source file, I'm going to include rectangle.h. I'm also going to include iostream because I'm going to need to do some printing. Okay, using namespace standard. All right, now some of you might be wondering, well, why didn't I just include iostream in the .h file? You could do that because once you include the .h file in the .cpp file, that would include iostream. Um, this is, uh, oh. I need to close in quotes. Okay. Um, but there, the reason is that unless you have um, unless you have something in the .h file that will actually it'll cause an error uh, for you not including a particular library, then it's usually a good idea to just leave it out. Um, but since we're actually using it in the .cpp file, then that's important for us to include it there. So the first thing is we'll we'll um, implement the the uh, default constructor. For the default constructor I'm just going to set the length and the width equal to zero. Um, and um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to have the next constructor. I'm going to have the um, non-default constructor double length double width. Now again since the parameters match, um, in this case they match the uh, names of the internal data members. Um, oops, I'm sorry. Um, actually, that's probably good that we did that. Um, this is the non-default constructor. Right? Okay, so let's see, did I make set dimension? Void set dimension, yes. Void needs to go here, though. All right, sorry about that. Um, I'm going to actually call set dimension from this non-default constructor because that's really what it's doing. It's it's setting the dimension to length and width. And since set dimension will have already been implemented, then we don't need to uh, do the same code twice. Anytime you see yourself doing the same code over and over again, or twice, or several times. Um, usually, unless it's just maybe just a small statement or whatever, um, it's a good idea to break it up into a into a function. In this case, it just makes sense. Okay, so the um, the thing we're going to do next is um, I'm going to in set dimension. You'll notice that I have length and width, and since those have the same name as this private data length and width, I have to be able to distinguish between the parameters named length and width and the internal data members. Now. If I just renamed this to L and W, then I would not have to uh, do what I'm about to do. But since they do have the same names, I have to say this length equals length, and this width equals width. Now, we talked about that in previous lectures, that um, if you just wrote length equals length, that's kind of silly. That, that would just basically set this parameter, which really what this does when you have parameters is that the the uh, runtime system um, gives you some memory temporary memory while this function is being called for length and width and it, you're going to set it equal to itself which is a complete waste of uh, CPU cycles and then the variables get destroyed the um, the private data never was touched if you just say length equals length and width equals width since they do have the same name as the internal data I prepend 
this and then the arrow operator um, in front of the length and the width, uh, respectively, to distinguish between this internal data. Remember this. Remember this is a pointer to the the current object. Okay. All right. So that's three things we've taken care of so far. Um, then we have the uh, not surprisingly the get length uh, const. Which all that does is return the length. And then we have get width, which is also const, and all that does is return the width. Then I have an area um, function, and what that does is it performs a calculation. Now, what's the area of a rectangle? Well, it's the length times the width, so that's all I'm going to return. Now, again, you could use a separate variable here. You could say, um, you know, a variable named... Uh, temp area or A and say A equals length times width and then return A but if you do it all in one fell swoop that's fine too. Rectangle, oops, double rectangle perimeter okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to return two times uh, length plus width and um, you'll note that this is just a this is equivalent to uh, 2 times width plus 2 times uh, length, right? Okay. And then finally, we're going to have a, a uh, print function. Okay, and all we're doing in here is we're going to say length equals the length, and then width equals and print out the width. The width. All right, so that's basically our rectangle. It's a fully functional rectangle, and we're all done with the rectangle. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a um, cube based on that rectangle. So in the header files, I'm going to right-click and go to Add New Item, and I'm going to add another header file. In this case, it's going to be called cube.h. Okay, you could call it box.h. Um, so we have cube, cube, okay. Now, now here's where the inheritance comes in. I have a class cube and then I put the colon here because a single colon, not a double colon, it's not the scope resolution operator. I have a single colon here, which, um, which indicates inheritance. And then I'm going to publicly derive from rectangle. Now, it, um, we have to include rectangle.h at the top, so this will work. And um, once we've done that, we're inheriting from rectangle. So that means we're going to obtain all of, um, we're going to inherit all of rectangle's public um, data and or uh, behaviors, in this case it will be behaviors, without having to redefine them. Okay. Now, so here we go, we've got cube, and then we've got a an overloaded version of cube length, double width, and double height. Then we also have a set dimension. Now you'll note that this is um, this is an overload. So that means that um, this one actually takes three parameters, so um, even though it has the same name, it will be distinguished from the version that was inherited for rectangle because it takes three uh, parameters. So you've got set dimension, you've got a get height also, you've got a, um, we didn't have to define get length or get width because those are already defined in rectangle. Now we're going to have surface area in volume and also another print uh, print function. And in the, uh, oops, I guess I should probably add a public section here and then a private section down here. And in the private section all we have is height because we don't need to maintain the width and the 
length that's done by rectangle. Now, one thing to note, this print right here has the exact same signature as the version in rectangle. See, this is rectangle, this has a print, void print const. That um, exact same version, or same signature, is in cube. So if I call, if I create an object of type cube and then call print, which one will get called? Well, it'll be the one that's defined in cube. This takes precedence over the version in rectangle. We'll talk about that in just a little bit and how we can call the rectangle version if need be. Um, okay, so um, the uh, next thing we want to do is we want to actually define what a cube is. So here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to create another source file. This time it's going to be a CPP file. It's going to be called cube.cpp. Okay. And for cube.cpp, I'm going to include cube.h. I'm also going to include iostream because I need that for printing. Okay. And um, this, uh, the first um, constructor is actually pretty easy. Okay, so. It's uh, pretty darn simple. We've just got cube and here, uh, cube, and then uh, the scope resolution operator, and then cube. And I say set the height equal to zero. And then I'm going to have an overloaded, uh, the overloaded um, version, the non-default constructor. And I want you to watch very carefully to what I'm about to do. Now, um, one way to do this when the when the cube is created it creates a rectangle, or it calls the rectangle constructor behind the scenes because we inherit from it. So you actually use the single colon here, and this is what we call initialization list um, syntax. So what we're saying here is we're going to call the, um, we're going to call the rectangles constructor with the length and the width, okay? So um, the only thing, uh, we know that that takes care of the dimensions, the length and the width. Um, the only thing we need to do inside of this constructor is set our height equal to height. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're going to define the set dimension, um, the set dimension member function. Okay, so um, the set dimension is going to be defined this way. Double length, double width, double height. All right, and um, you can explicitly specify that you're calling a function from the rectangle. I'm going to do, and then I'm going to ind individually set the um, height. Okay. So um, the next thing is the get height. Oops. So we've got the get height function here, and. Um, this get height function allows us to simply retrieve the height. We don't need to define the get length and get width, as I mentioned before, because those are already defined in rectangle, and we inherit those because they're public. And um, the next thing is the surface area. Now, this one might look a little bit squirrely, but if, I assure you, if you go over the, uh, it's basically the area of each of the faces of the cube, right? Okay, so there are six faces of the cube, and um, this is how we can. This is one way we can calculate them. Um, it's a little bit of a distribution. Okay, so you've got get length times get width, and and um, so we've got get length. Uh, times get width plus uh, get length times the height plus oops should be a that's a function call okay plus 
get width. That was the height. Okay. So there's our surface area. And the uh, volume is not so difficult. So we're going to just say that it's return the area, which this is derived from the rectangle class, right? Just like these are derived from the rectangle class classes, the uh, the get length and get width um, are derived from the rectangle class. So we've got area times height, right? Because that's it's basically the next dimension um, of the area is uh, is the volume. So we get the area, and then you take the area times the height. So it's length times width times height. Since this already accounts for length times width. Then we just multiply by height and we're all we're set. We're good to go. Okay, so the next thing is the um, print uh, function of the cube. First, you're going to print out the rectangles you're going to print out the rectangle um, uh, call its print uh, function and um, then you're going to uh, separately print out the height. Okay. So the next thing is, we're, since we're pretty much done with the class, we're going to go to the uh, main file, and I'm going to include cube. I could include rectangle also and just deal with rectangles also, because they are independent. Or the rectangle is independent of the cube at least, not vice versa. Um, I'm creating a new cube with 15, 20, and 10, and I can call my cube dot print, and we could look at what that does. Okay. All right, so it's built, and we're going to run it, and we see that. It says length equals 15, width equals 20. That's from the call to the print function of the rectangle. And then the height, this is from the additional information that we added uh, from the cube. Now you can also print out or uh, obtain the uh, surface area cube dot surface area. We could call it get surface area if we wanted to. That's fine too. Um, but you'd have to rename it in the um, the .h file. Same thing with volume. We could get volume if we wanted it to be. Okay, so that's that. All right. So there you go. Pretty straightforward. Um, I, I give two examples. I have the cube and I also have the um, example for uh, a, an employee and an hourly worker inside of the uh, lesson materials for this week. Now, um, so that's pretty much there's a couple uh, other little items. And we, I talk about protected members. That's another access specifier that we have not, uh, we have not dealt with thus far. Uh, per, because it didn't make sense. Uh, protected members, basically what that means is that um, to the outside world, if a class has a protected data member, instead of being public or private, if it has a protected uh, member, which is a keyword, protected, um, that basically means to the outside world, it's the same as if it was private. The outside world can't access it. Okay, But to a derived class, a derived class uh, can access the protected members of the base class as if they were public. So it's kind of in between private and public. I give a nice little table at the end of the supplemental material that outlines um, what does private, protected, and public mean. So, all right. Um, that's that for this particular, um, the topics of this lecture, except for one other thing, I, uh, one other set of topics I have to mention is because the capstone project depends on it. Um, we're going to open up paint because we kind of need a conce uh, conceptual overview of it more than anything. Um, 
we're going to talk about some uh, two different abstract data types, ADTs, abstract data types. The two that we're going to talk about are called stacks and queues. Um, firstly, let's talk about a stack. Okay, stack, the stack ADT, stack abstract data type. If paint is not going to freeze on me, okay. So we've got the stack abstract data type here. Um, a stack is what we call a um, LIFO data structure. Okay, LIFO data structure. Now the reason we call it a LIFO data structure is because um, it adds items to the data structure in a last in first out manner. Okay, so for example, um, let's say that I have um, I'm, I have a stack of integers and I have a four at the very bottom, the first item I add to the stack. When you add an item to the stack, it's called pushing an item onto the stack. Now, how do we add on another item? Um, well, you basically add it to the uh, You add that on top of the uh, current item, okay? So it's just like a stack of books. If you're doing it the right way, um, and you have a stack of books, you're going to put one book on top of another. Now, how do you take the books off? Well, you could, or the way you're supposed to, is you're supposed to take it off the top. That's how a stack works. So you take that off, and then we're done with that. Now, this is the new top of the stack. Okay, now you could end up with, um, keep adding, you could end up uh, continuing to add um, further items onto the stack. And then each time you add an item onto the stack, it always goes onto the top of the stack. Okay. Um, let's see, I'll try five. That's hot. Every time you add a new item onto the stack, you are adding it to the top of the stack. And every time you take an item off of the stack, you have to take it off of the top. That's why we call it last in, first out data structure. Because the last item that you put onto the stack has to be the first one that comes off. Okay? That's the stack ADT. The other very common and very popular abstract data type that's taught in a lot of different uh, courses is the Q ADT. Okay? So, one second. the Q abstract data type. Okay, Q, U, E, U, E, and this one is a FIFO data structure. So it's a little bit different. Um, it behaves differently the, from the stack. The Q is like a line, okay, like a line in a cafeteria. We generally, generally like looking at it this way. Um, sideways instead of um, instead of uh, stacked up, okay, like a stack of books, because that would be a stack. Um, the first item in the queue is the five. Let's say we add another item. Well, the five stays in the front of the queue, and the next item that we add will be put in line behind the um, the first item that we added. Okay, so this one, let's say it's a, a 12. Okay. Now we can continue doing this. Every time you add an item to the queue, you go to the back of the line. It's just like a lunch line in school. No cuts allowed. You go into uh, the line. Okay. Now when, when someone exits the queue or something exits the queue, you take it from the front of the queue, not the back. Okay, and then the second item or the next item in line becomes the new front. And then um, what we call this is when you add an item to the queue, we call it enqueuing, enqueuing. And when you um, delete an item from the queue, we call it dequeuing. Okay, so for stack, when you add an item to the stack on the top, it's called pushing. When you take items off the stack, it's called popping. Okay, popping is taking off, pushing is adding on. For queue, enqueuing is adding in, 
DQing is taking items out. That's why it's called a, this is why the queue is called the first in, first out data structure, because the first item that you add to the queue is the first item that's out. It's distinguished from the stack where the most recent item that you added, the last item that you added, is the first one out. Sometimes you'll see this as Philo, F-I-L-O, which is first in, last out. It's the same thing as last in, first out. But Q is FIFO, first in, first out. Okay, so that's a conceptual overview. You need that because um, we need it for our next programming project, the Capstone project, which I have um, uploaded. The, um, the Capstone project is worth 200 points. Um, it is actually, if you paid attention to what I just said about stacks, you do a little bit of reading on your own. There's even some information in the book about it, which I'm sure would help. Um, if you if you do this, uh, you'll probably find that this is easier than programming project three. Okay. So in the course, we've discussed many different topics, including the fundamental um, fundamentals of abstract data types, such as the uh, stacks and queues. For your capstone project, you're to implement a stack, a static array-based stack. Okay, there are many different ways to implement a stack. All right, there are ways that we have not even, we're not actually going to cover in this course that you would you would cover probably in a um, second computer science course at university. Um, fundamentals of data structures and algorithms, um, where they would cover. Um, things like linked lists and dynamic arrays and things like that. Um, we haven't we haven't actually covered how to make your own dynamic arrays in this class, and we haven't covered linked lists. But we do know how to make static arrays. Um, you could, if you wanted to, make this a dynamic stack um, using a vector or using an uh, well using a vector from the uh, from the um, uh, standard template library if you wanted to. But it's not really necessary. Um, I just want you to have a maximum items and also the internal array that will uh, hold these items here. You're going to have a constructor. Um, I'm basically giving you the .h file here, by the way. Um, you have a constructor. You have push, which pushes an integer onto the stack. So we know this one, particular one's an integer stack. Pop, all it does is remove an item from the stack. It does not return it or anything. It just removes it. And then you're going to have a function called top that returns the item at the current top of the stack. And then two um, observer uh, functions that ask the stack, are you empty or are you full? Okay, so top is the index of the top item of the stack. Then you have max items, which would be the maximum number of items in the stack. And then you have an internal array that will hold the items. <clears throat> so this should get you started. You might have to slightly modify this to get it to work if you get any errors when you try to build this. Um, if you have any questions though, feel free to, uh, to email me or post on the discussion board. So it's a stack of integers. The underlying data structure that contains the actual elements of the stack is a built-in array. Okay, so you're going to have a built-in array here. You must keep track of the index of the top element so that you may return the item at the top. Um, for the constructor, this should set the top of the stack to its initial value. Negative 1 is a good initial value because it's an invalid index. This can signal that the stack is empty. That's an easy way to keep track of is the stack empty or is the stack full, is what is the top equal to. If the top's equal to negative 1, then you automatically know that the stack is empty. Okay, easy. Then when you push an item onto the stack, as long as the stack isn't full, you can add an item to the stack. If the stack is full, you should print out the stack is full, you cannot add any more items. For pop, now pop, you can't pop on an empty stack. So um, look at the distinction between full and empty here. If the stack is not empty, you remove that item from the top and then you set the top of the index or top to the index of the next element in the stack. So, it, for example, you basically are subtracting one from the from the um, uh, top index every time you take an item off. Now, if it gets back to negative one, that means the stack will be um, empty. 
if the stack is empty, when you try to pop, you have to print out to the user the stack is empty, you cannot pop on an empty stack. The top just returns the top. Um, do not return the index of the element at the top. I want you to return the actual element at the top. Okay. Um, is empty and is full are pretty self-explanatory, and this, ex this explains what uh, full and empty are. You will have three files. You have uh, cstack.h, cstack.cpp, and then main.cpp. Um, for cstack and, c and for the cstack.h and cpp files, <clears throat> please make sure that your class name does match that. Um, I don't want to see like all kinds of goofy uh, naming conventions or you know you calling this header.h and this implementation.cpp. Don't do that. Call them the names of the class that you're implementing, and make sure it, make sure the case is the same. Okay, I will t I, for this particular assignment. I'm going to be a lot more persnickety, uh, particular, and I'm going to, um, like I said here, actually up here, it says do not call it sausage dot h c stack with the you know two letter s, s t and then a capital s, or just call it stack dot h or any other construct. I want you to call it c stack. Okay. C stack right here, and it should be in C stack .h, and the implementation file should be C stack .cpp. I want to make sure that you can follow instructions. Now, um, you should have probably been okay with following instructions up to this point, uh, but I, I let a lot of stuff slide, and, let, and I was kind of easy on, um, you know, grading and stuff like that, and some of my expectations. But for this particular one, the capstone, make sure it is perfect. Okay, I have to make, I have to get it so that it is. Um, um, adheres completely to specifications. All right, now I did give you the caveat that you might need to modify this slightly, specifically where the um, max items and the array are concerned. Okay, so for example, if you make this a um, constant, what are your options for initializing it? Okay, um, so things like that. So think about that. Um, okay. I will only accept digital copies of the full source code and the solution. You have to compress it into uh, the entire folder containing the solution file. Um, a couple of you didn't quite do this right for program two, which I'm going to be in the process of grading and in the process of grading. Um, should have that done hopefully by the by next week sometime. Just make sure that you compress the whole uh, solution directory. All right. So that's pretty much it for this lecture. Um, if you have any questions, please post to the discussion board. I will create a, um, a capstone project. Let me just do that right now so I don't forget it. I will create a capstone project, um, a new form. I need a new topic, right? OK, so we've got programming project help. We'll call this the capstone project help. OK, OK, good. So um, that's pretty much it. I mean, you have capstone project help here, too, um, and a couple other things. So if you need anything, make sure to post <clears throat> to the uh, website, to the Desire to Learn website, and um, email me if you have any specific questions that you don't want to maybe expose to your colleagues or, you know, you, don't, you probably don't want to post your entire code on the discussion board. So, all right, thank you, and have a great week. Bye.